Welcome everybody. For those of you who are visitors to campus, a special welcome. We're glad to see you all today. Uh, my name is Kenneth Townsend and among other things I chair the Public Events Committee of the college and we're really excited to have Catherine Wilkinson with us today. I know I say that every week I'm excited but Catherine, <laughs> but Catherine and I actually have known each other for a while and I'm especially glad that she's been able to to work us into her book tour as it were. Um, but before we move on to Catherine, Dominica Perry is going to come and say a few words about an organization that she wants to tell you a little bit about as well as to provide a bit more of a, an overview of Catherine and her work. She has been instrumental really in helping make this happen. Um, Dominica is going to be teaching a class here at Millsaps in the spring as well, so some of these students, maybe you'll see her um, in the classroom soon. So Dominica, do you want to come on up? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dominica. So I'm Dominica Perry. Uh, when I spoke here, he also said that it's a great pleasure, so I don't know exactly how to take it. Uh, <laughs> but I am here to introduce our new nonprofit that is, that is designed for educational purposes and advocacy purposes to promote um, scientific knowledge of climate change and an open discussion. Um, Catherine is one of our first presenters. She is a phenomenal catch. We're very happy that, that, that we have her here. She has a BA from a university which name I always mispronounce. It's a southern thing, Sawani. Uh, <laughs> Now everybody would remember. Uh, this, was, this was a degree in religion, and then she became a Rhodes Scholar, the genius she is, and uh, ended up getting a PhD in Geography and Environmental Studies from Oxford. And her dissertation is also something that I wanted you to, to think about, because I find that, as you can see, a very interesting uh, piece of publication. This is, this is a book on climate change and religion, which I think is extremely important in, in um, uh, in our state. Today she's going to be talking about her newest project, which is The Drawdown, which is also a fascinating book and, and a great project. Um, and uh, thank you so much for coming. Hopefully there will be many more to see Mississippi events throughout the city and Millsaps as well. Thank you. Thank you all so much for having me, for bringing me. We had a uh, really fun night in Hattiesburg last night at T-Bones, which I think is the coolest place that I've talked about climate change, because they have records and beer, um, and they gave us tank tops. So <laughs> the whole thing has been worthwhile <laughs> just, just for that. Um, so we're going to start today where I think every good and reputable climate talk starts, which is with emojis. So there's kind of a basic story that we have been telling about climate change in recent years, which is it's bad, it's going to get really bad, we're headed towards a potentially unlivable planet, and we're not super well equipped as a species to change course, recycle your Coke cans, change your light bulbs, forgo plastic shopping bags, and then cross your fingers for some kind of silver bullet policy and or tech geoengineering solution. So it's basically doom and gloom, threat and fear, good luck, is, is, sort, of, is sort of how climate communication has, has gone. Um, there are reasons for this story, but it's a story that tends to leave us in not a very useful place, which is to say we feel kind of psych 101, right? Overwhelmed, afraid, guilty, ashamed, hopeless, paralyzed, something like these monkeys. <laughs> um, you know, we just, we don't want to hear it, we don't want to see it, and we don't think really that there's anything we can do. So the way we're communicating about this problem is leaving us with a terrible foundation for action, when action is exactly the thing that we're, we're striving for. And the magnitude of the problem compared to the magnitude, or lack thereof, of the solutions that get prescribed to individuals just seems so wildly out of step, right? We could recycle Coke cans for the rest of our days, which we should be doing, and we could change light bulbs for the rest of our days, which we should be doing, and it doesn't seem like we're going to avoid the fiery, unlivable planet situation. Um, so it does, I think, leave a lot of people either actively thinking it's game over, 
or wondering if it might be. Um, so I started my morning at St. Andrews with all of the eighth graders, which was fairly intimidating. <laughs> um, and, and they wrote down questions as we went through uh, talking about some things. And the, the first question that got asked was, is the planet doomed? And I think that's a really fair question, given that so much of the conversation about climate change is about the problem. The problem isn't the whole story. And the other side of the story is what we have tried to bring to life in, in this book. So Drawdown is the product of uh, kind of living, research, and communication, and increasingly action project. We are a nonprofit called Project Drawdown. We're based out in uh, Sausalito, California, but I'm in Atlanta. Our founder and executive director, Paul Hawken, um, found himself kind of over a number of years grappling with a sort of persistent set of questions. Is it actually game over? Do we actually know what we should be doing? Do we know what tools we have in the toolbox? And do we know how much each of those things can do for us when it comes to addressing greenhouse gas emissions? In other words, do we actually know what is possible? So he kind of pitched this, right? Like, we need a list. We just need a list. And before this book came out, if you had Googled top 10 solutions to global warming, you would have gotten really useful things like forgo fossil fuels. Good luck with that. Right? Um, use a power strip in your home entertainment center. Again, like, not sure that's in the top 10, really? <laughs> um, you know, so you get sort of motherhood and apple pie, things that feel totally out of reach, and then things that feel really, really tiny. Um, so Paul, Paul kept saying to lots of big environmental uh, NGOs and, and other, other groups, hey, somebody should do this math. Somebody should map out the landscape of climate solutions and actually calculate how much impact all these things can have. And people kept saying, that's a great idea. We're absolutely not going to take that on. <laughs> so ultimately, um, kind of Paul being Paul, he's a longtime uh, thought leader and author and entrepreneur in <coughs> the environmental space. He founded Project Drawdown to, to do this work. Um, so to do kind of the, 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 the mathy, modeling side, but then also, because Paul's a writer um, and, a, and a brilliant communicator, to bring the answers to life, not in yet another dry and impenetrable and wonky climate report that no one wants to read, not even those of us who work in this field, um, but to try and translate it into a book and ultimately a whole bunch of other uh, kind of communication mediums that are accessible that educate but also inspire and evoke some curiosity and wonder. So, so that's what we have tried to, to do in this project. We are very much um, a, a community of people. So this, this book really is kind of a snapshot of ongoing work by a global collaborative. So we had over 60 research fellows from six continents, 22 countries who worked on literature reviews and modeling. We have 130 or so advisors who are some of the world's top thinkers and experts on climate science and climate action. And a wonderful board and then a very small, but I think mighty staff uh, who are kind of doing the, the day in and day out on this work. So what's in a name? Draw down. <clears throat> Global warming, just to, to sort of state the obvious, is caused by a rising concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So we hit 402 parts per million of carbon dioxide last year. I think we've already hit 407, 410 uh, this year. And we're continuing on, on the up and up and up. The last time greenhouse gas concentrations were this high, human beings weren't around. So as we project what could happen, right, what the realities could be for us. It is all projection. We're living in Terra Nova. 
right? Um, we, we don't know where, where we are or really where we're headed. Um, and it's that very uncertainty that should make us wake up and make us take action. Um, you hear a lot, again, in the climate space about slowing emissions or reducing emissions or mitigating emissions or stabilizing somewhere at some heightened level of greenhouse gases. But stabilizing in Terra Nova, where we've never lived as a species, seems crazy, right? When you actually step back and, and think about that. And so one of the things we wanted to do with Drawdown was to put forward a goal that's actually worthy of humanity. That is a big goal, but an accessible goal and a goal that people can understand, which is simply this. If you are driving the wrong way, down the wrong road, you don't want to just slow down and keep going down the wrong road. You actually want to turn around and head back the other way. So the term drawdown as we use it refers to that point in time when the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere could and hopefully will peak and then begin to decline on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, so this morning when uh, at St. Andrews talking about this and I said, okay, right, so we've got this line going up and up and up, you know, what, what then would we want to do? And, uh, and this young man raised his hand and he said, <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's pretty much it. That's drawdown. <laughs> um, so it's really about a goal that heads us back towards the conditions that we know are most conducive for life on this planet. And what we found as we started to dig into the research is that humanity has actually been creating a plan to get to drawdown and to begin reversing global warming, we just didn't realize that that's what we've been up to. Because in this very kind of diffuse and organic and non-hierarchical way, people have been out in backyards and forests and laboratories and companies and halls of government testing ideas and technologies and practices and learning what works and learning maybe what doesn't and refining and trying again. It's in this incredible human effort, actually, um, and, and very iterative effort. And as we've been doing this testing and learning, a really incredible body of data and peer-reviewed literature has built up about all of these solutions. And so our job at Drawdown was not to kind of get on a whiteboard and make up what we thought the best plan was. It was actually to gather the data and the research from around the world and to bring it together and codify it, right? To really wrap our arms around the collective wisdom of humanity and then reflect back to us what we already know. And, and in many ways what we're already doing, which I think is, is incredibly exciting. So solutions are solutions because they do one or both of two things, right? If the line's going up and up and up and we wanna, <laughs> um, we can either stop sending greenhouse gases up, right, through energy efficiency, through switching out energy sources, reducing consumption, protecting ecosystems, but we can also bring carbon back home. So again, a lot of times in the climate discourse, carbon becomes a villain, right? We talk about decarbonizing our economy and we're gonna slash emissions and we're gonna, right? Um, carbon is this incredibly critical building block of life and the problem is that we've taken too much of it from down here and sent it up there. So in many ways, what we actually want to do is recarbonize the economy, which is to say we want to harness the incredible technology of photosynthesis to actually engage in absorbing carbon dioxide and sequestering carbon in plants, soil, biomass. Um, again, we, we tend to talk a lot about carbon capture and sequestration technology, which I know has been a, a topic in, in Mississippi in particular. Well, guess what? The planet already knows how to do this really, really well. Um, and there are, there are some incredible things that we can learn and some incredible things that we can sort of um, bolster and, and accelerate. We organized the uh, modeling and the book into sectors. So these are kind of clusters of action or impact. Energy, food, women and girls, buildings and cities, land use, transport, and materials. There are 80 solutions that fall into these sectors. 
And those are, are kind of the trains that have already left the station. So there are technologies and practices that um, we're using, they're working, they're scaling, not everywhere, but in some places. And so we ask the question, if you were to take each one of those things and scale them vigorously but plausibly between now and the middle of the century, how many emissions can they reduce? What's it gonna cost? And how much money will we save? And there are 20 additional solutions that are in the book, but they're not modeled. There are no numbers attached to them. We call them coming attractions. So there are things that are um, scientifically valid, and maybe they are nascent, emerging, perhaps still kind of in research and development. Um, and they're, they're evidence, I think, of how very much humanity is on the case. And they also look like we're going to get help from at least some of them. Um, in the next three decades, but we couldn't do the same kind of projections uh, that we did with the others. This is the moment uh, where if you are the betting type, you could write down what you think the top five climate solutions are. I will tell you that um, right, we have this incredible board of advisors, 130 or so, so folks, and as we started to get the results of the modeling finalized before the publication of the book, People start saying, well, what, what, you know, what did you find? And Paul would say, well, you tell me. You're a lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Surely you know what the top five solutions to climate change are. And people would oh, write down, write down. Well, did I get it right? And Paul would say, well, that wasn't the point of the question. You're one of the world's leading climate experts, and you don't know what the top five solutions to climate change are. If you don't know, how the heck is anybody else supposed to know? And what in the world does that mean for what we're supposed to do, right? So this is what a solution looks like. We really had fun with the imagery in this book. Um, we really wanted to bring some kind of unexpectedness, some humanness, some culture, um, to try and make these things more human. And, and, more, and more accessible. So this is a bicycle mechanic in Berlin. He's taking the latest model of their electric bicycle uh, in, the, in the shop out for a spin, right? So you can imagine <clears throat> a bicycle that is a little bit better getting up hills and can go a little bit faster and you maybe don't show up quite as sweaty becomes a more realistic alternative to a car or to a bus. Um, and, and so electric bicycles Interesting opportunity, number 67 out of, out of 80. This is a, a portrait from a really beautiful series. This is a, a Dasanak woman, which is an ethnic group in Sudan and Ethiopia. And she and other women in her village have started uh, kind of gathering like the detritus of 21st century civilization, you know, SIM cards and um, as you can see, a lot of beer bottle caps and refashioning those into headdresses and jewelry, right? So we could have done you know, a, an image of a bunch of curbside recycling bins in a suburban neighborhood, and that would have been extremely expected and extremely boring, right? So, so this is some of, some of what we were trying, trying to do, um, bringing the visual part of this uh, body of work to life. It is entirely possible that no one has ever heard of the number nine solution. It's silvopasture. Anybody intimately familiar with silvopasture? Right, number nine. Um, so silvopasture, it comes from the Latin words for forest and grazing. Conventional wisdom would tell us that cows and trees don't belong together, but actually these integrated tree and livestock systems are kind of ancient practice. And they're great for a whole host of reasons. So they are, um, the land uh, is healthier, they're more resilient to drought and extreme weather events. Um, for farmers, you're growing sort of one crop um, on one timeline, right? You might have a timber, timber crop or you might have nut trees or fruit trees, also livestock or maybe dairy. So you've got multiple products on the same land going to market at different times. You're, you're sort of more insulated from risk. When it comes to emissions, a pasture with trees sequesters five to 10 times more carbon than a, than a pasture without trees. So 
really simple sort of secret secret sauce. Um, and as you can see, well, let's talk actually about the numbers. So the number in the upper right um, is is kind of the you know the, the sort of star of the show in a lot of ways. So this is the amount of emissions reductions that this particular solution can deliver between 2020 and 2050. Again, if it's scaled globally in a way that's sort of vigorous but plausible. Gigatons uh, is, the, is the unit that, that we use. So a gigaton is a billion tons. And this is a, a helpful image, I think, because a cow weighs about a ton. So a gigaton is about a billion cows. And we emitted about 36 gigatons of carbon dioxide last year, so about 36 billion cows worth of carbon dioxide up into the atmosphere. That emissions number then drives the ranking. So not all of the solutions impact carbon dioxide. Some of them impact other greenhouse gases or multiple greenhouse gases. But there are pretty simple formulas to translate um, everything into its carbon dioxide equivalent. So that's what lets us do kind of an apples to apples comparison of one solution to the other and end up ranking them. And everyone, it seems, loves rankings, so, <laughs> so this, I think, is a, is a good thing. The net cost is the incremental cost to implement the solution. So if you currently have a pasture without trees, what's it going to cost for you to put in place a silvopasture system rather than just sticking with what you've got? Um, or if you're going to buy an electric vehicle instead of a gasoline-powered car, What's the extra that you're going to pay for that electric vehicle? And then at the same time, as you operate that thing, the silver pasture system or the electric vehicle, over 30 years, how much money are you going to save? And in most cases, there is some amount of cost to implement. It's not true across the board. Um, and in most cases, there is savings. And that's also not true um, in every single case. But that's sort of the, the general trend. These are the top 20 solutions. They are uh, ranked according to their emissions reduction potential. And the top 20 represent about three quarters of the total emissions reductions um, from these models. And we modeled everything as a system, right, as a global system. So we've assumed uh, on, on the way that we did the math, you can do all of these things um, at, at the same time. If anyone got five out of the top five, um, claim your prize. <laughs> um, there's some really, really interesting insights and, and a lot of surprises and some unsung heroes, I think, in, in the top 20. So I will zip through some of those. That's always part of the challenge of this work, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming, which is sort of intentionally cheeky and, and brash because there had never been a plan. So it's very easy to, to claim such a thing. Um, but you can never uh, sort of do adequate justice to, to all of them. The first thing that I think is, is really a surprise is that the largest overall sector is food in terms of impact. Eight of the top 20 solutions. And that's because food plays on both sides of that arrows equation. So you can avoid sending greenhouse gases up um, in terms of what we produce and how we produce it. But also, you can use regenerative agricultural practices like silvopasture that end up having this incredible carbon sequestration benefit as well. And there's also a big one, which is reducing food waste so we don't have to produce quite so much. This is a, a photograph <clears throat> that was taken in, uh, in England these are rejected potatoes and carrots. They are too ugly to go to the grocery store um, and, and be purchased. Around the world, about a third of the food that we produce isn't consumed. That's about 40% in the US. And that wasted food drives roughly 8% of our greenhouse gas emissions. There was actually, when we got to, uh, to this last night um, in, in Hattiesburg, uh, there was a baby that started crying. And I was like, yes. If you just need a good, try, a good cry, you should Google photos of food waste. It's really, really shocking. And not just for environmental impacts, right? We think about a world in which people are malnourished and hungry and how much food is being wasted. And this just 
seems insane, I think. Um, in lower income parts of the world, uh, food waste is often uh, driven by uh, infrastructure issues. So um, inadequate storage, um, or maybe there's not good access to labor or markets um, to, to actually to sell the food. Um, but in, in regions like ours, regions of higher income, we tend to waste by choice. So we don't like uh, ugly produce, we serve huge portions, we um, you know, ha have a sort of enough wealth oftentimes that we can conveniently forget about the leftover lasagna in the back of the fridge, right? Um, and, and so there are a ton of opportunities um, and a ton of ways in to, to start shifting that. Really, really fascinating, I think, in France and now also in Italy, they have simply adopted laws that say grocery stores can't throw away food. So the food finds its way to people who need it, or maybe to a pig farm, or sort of worst case scenario, it gets into a compost bin rather than a landfill, where in a landfill, as it decomposes, it generates methane, which is a greenhouse gas about 34 times as potent as carbon dioxide. So some really interesting, I, I think, solutions emerging in this space. And it's also an issue that every single person can impact immediately and, no, and at no cost which I also think is, is super exciting. And the same is true of solution number four. Free in our control, adoptable now. This is a, um, a painting of Vertumnus, who is the Roman god of seasons, plant growth. I think he's quite uh, wonderful. What we basically did with this solution is to do the math on Michael Pollan's now sort of famous guidance of eat food, not too much, and mostly plants. So we did not assume that the whole world goes vegan or vegetarian. You can imagine how high the number would be um, if, if we had done that. We assume that in parts of the world like ours, where people are consuming so much animal protein that we actually are seeing a lot of chronic health problems related to it, that consumption comes down to a healthy level, but also in parts of the world where people are not getting enough protein or they're malnourished, that actually diets improve. So we looked at, at both sides of that equation. Uh, livestock are, are the kicker, right, and particularly ruminants, so cows and sheep who, as they digest uh, their food, as they ferment cellulose in their second stomach, they create methane, which mostly comes out as burps, contrary to, to popular opinion. Um, but cows, if they all lived in, their, in the same nation, they would come in third behind China and the U.S. in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. That's how big of, a, of an issue this is. And we don't talk about it, right? We talk about cars and we talk about electricity and, and we don't talk about, about this piece of the picture. And I think that's partially because food is cultural and it's personal. I can't tell you how often you know, people kind of get hot and bothered and it's like, I'm not giving up barbecue. <laughs> it's like, that's fine, that's great. But we don't need to be consuming as much animal protein um, as, as we currently are. Energy comes in second in terms of uh, kind of a, a sector, and this is really focused on electricity generation. Um, this is one of my very favorite photographs from the book. This is an Uru family uh, who live on Lake Titicaca, and they live on a, a reed island in a reed house. And up until this moment, um, the way they have had light at night for the girls to do their homework is with kerosene lamps, which you can imagine is not a great recipe in a reed house on a reed island. And it's also not a great recipe because kerosene lamps are incredibly polluting, so it's really bad for indoor air quality, um, for health, and also um, they cause emissions. They, they emit black carbon and, and other greenhouse gases. Um, so what I think is, is really so cool about this particular solution, and it's true of so many of them, um, that this isn't just about addressing emissions, right? Rooftop solar is really powerful in terms of an energy alternative, but it's gonna be really, really powerful for the 1.1 billion people around the world who don't have access to electricity. And we're not going to build electric grids, right? That's crazy investment in infrastructure when you can have distributed energy sources and battery storage and microgrids, right, that all of a sudden um, bring this critical resource 
to human development. Um, think of what it's like to run a business after dark if you don't have electricity. So I think it's really exciting. The other thing that I love about rooftop solar, um, as I was kind of digging around looking for some good, interesting history and stories, the first rooftop solar system went up in 1884 in New York City. Um, at that point, these sort of tinkerer experimentalists had figured out that a very thin layer of selenium, not silicon yet, just selenium, um, would conduct electricity if it was exposed to light. And so this guy Charles Fritz puts one of these systems up on his rooftop. You know, it barely makes any electricity, but he is absolutely convinced that someday what he calls these photoelectric modules will wind up competing with coal-fired power plants. And the first one of those Thomas Edison had brought online in 1882. So right from the get-go, Solar has, has sort of had fossil fuel energy in its sights, which I, I think is, is sort of cool. We looked also at non-agricultural land use that has an impact on protecting stocks of carbon um, and increasing sequestration. This is another, another of my favorites. I'm really just sort of doing a tour of like my favorite children from the book. This is peatlands. So peatlands, bogs, mires, they make up about 3% of the world's land area, but they hold more carbon, twice as much carbon, in fact, than all the world's forests. We never talk about peatlands. We talk about forests all the time, and we should be talking about forests all the time. The peatlands are such an incredible opportunity, and they're also such an incredible potential problem. So they're under threat from forestry and fire and farming, but what we've looked at is the opportunity to create more acreage of protected peatlands. Um, as I was working on this one, I was like, how do you make peatlands cool, right? Or like, you know, more engaging. And what I found after much digging was that the Irish poet Seamus Heaney actually wrote a number of wonderful poems about uh, Irish boglands in the, in the 60s. And in one of them, he describes the ground itself is kind black butter, which I just thought was like, well, now you sort of get what a peatland is, right? They're just layers and layers and layers and layers of decomposing plant matter um, that's about 50% carbon. Very cool, I think. The number one is extremely unsexy. Uh, we were very disappointed in, in some ways to, to have this outcome of, of the math. Um, this is a solution that focuses on the chemical refrigerants that are in our AC units and refrigerators and cold storage and cold chains. Um, I won't go into too terribly much detail here, but the refrigerants that came into use to replace the ones that were destroying the ozone layer, great on the one hand, because they have very minimal impact on the ozone layer, but they turn out to be a thousand or more times as effective as carbon dioxide in terms of their greenhouse effect their ability to, to warm the planet. Um, so what we've looked at here is super simple, managing leaks, managing disposal. Um, the world actually agreed last year to amend the Montreal Protocol, so we'll be phasing out the use of these um, high global warming potential refrigerants, but as we get through that, we'll still have a lot in circulation um, that we can and, and need to manage better. There's a section of the book that focuses on women and girls. These are three solutions, um, and they are really about advancing the rights and well-being and opportunities of women and girls that happen to have positive ripple effects for the planet. So number six is educating girls. This is a young woman who's in school in Kenya, but there are about 130 million girls who are not in school around the world today, although they're of school age. Education, of course, is an intrinsic and fundamental human right, um, and it also lays, why would we be here, right, if it didn't lay a really important foundation um, for successful and healthy and, and vibrant lives. And the positive ripple effects of educating girls just go on and on and on and on. Lower rates of HIV, AIDS, and malaria, lower uh, maternal and infant mortality, higher wages and better upward mobility, more productive farms. Like, it's really, the data is amazing. It also turns out 
that women who have more years of education choose with their partners to have smaller families. And the children that they have have more resources invested in them and they're healthier. Um, and so what you end up with over time, right, as you project out to 2050, is fewer feet making their carbon footprints on the planet. And I think it's really important to remember two or maybe three things about these, right? So one is that in parts of the world like ours, per capita greenhouse gas emissions are huge compared to most of the parts of the world where girls are having a hard time getting educated. So women and girls didn't cause climate change. They certainly cannot solve it on their own. But advancing this right is one piece of a much bigger system of solutions that can, can indeed have, have an impact. It also turns out that education is critical for climate adaptation. So the number one factor for whether women and girls will survive a natural disaster is their level of education. So you're less likely to be hurt or displaced or killed if you've had more years of schooling. You're better able to adapt perhaps your home garden or your family's agricultural plot to changing dynamics because you can access not just kind of inherited ways of knowing that have been passed down, but also um, books and other sources of, of information. So it shores up resilience even at the same time as, as it has an impact on, on the problem. This is what the kind of whole picture looks like of these 80 solutions. Um, and as I was saying about kind of thinking of educating girls within this bigger system, a system created this challenge and a system is going to have to solve it. You know, we, I think, have a tendency to think like, oh, this like huge whopping problem, we need a huge whopping solution, right? Also this morning in St. Andrews, a couple of, um, of, of boys came up after and they were like, well, couldn't we just get up there in the atmosphere and harness the carbon dioxide and send it to space? <laughs> I was like, well, that, and then they were like, or we could all become plants. <laughs> and I was like, well, these are both very interesting ideas. Right? Um, I don't know that we're going to have those solutions quite in time uh, to, to deal with this, but I think that's the inclination, right? And instead, the inclination should be there are so many footholds for action. There is a role to play for every individual, and every institution, and every community, and every business, and every government, right? This is not something that sits in the halls of power. And in the process of pursuing these solutions, we end up building a healthier, more vibrant, more prosperous, more equitable, and more resilient world. And that is incredibly exciting. I want to zip through just a few more pictures because they're too good to, to skip. This is a Carbody bear in the Great Bear Rainforest uh, chowing down on some salmon. Temperate forests, uh, this is a beautiful shot from the Fjordlands in New Zealand. This is an actual athlete uh, in training off the coast of Norfolk, England, where there's a uh, big wind farm. This is a shot off the uh, roof of the hospital in Basel, Switzerland, where they have installed a green roof to reduce um, energy uh, for heating and air conditioning. Uh, this is a, a shot from the former accounting firm of the Oscars, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, there's a guy in Toronto, the one walking, and a colleague of his in Prague who has logged into this iPad on a Segway situation, and he can zip around the office and go find his colleagues or join a meeting without having to put muscle and bone and skin and blood on an airplane and ship it, right? Just the ideas can go. Um, and with better and better telepresence technology, you can have um, a more connected and, and sort of realistic experience, which isn't going to replace entirely our need to, to get on airplanes, um, but it could do that quite a bit and end up saving companies a ton of money in the process. We looked at um, increasing the, uh, and, and making more clear and secure the land rights of indigenous people who use um, traditional uh, land management practices that protect forests and end up sequestering more carbon. You can imagine lots and lots of positive ripple effects here as well. This is a great shot um, of, of a power plant, geothermal power plant in, in Iceland. The waste from the power plant gets piped into the Blue Lagoon geothermal spa. Anyone ever been there? You were bathing in wastewater? Amazing. 
This is the Rocky Mountain Institute uh, uh, net zero building that's in Colorado. So this building, although it's in one of the coldest zones in, in the US, it's so well insulated and it's so efficient that it produces more energy than it uses. Very cool, solar panels on the roof. We looked at practices for reducing methane in rice production, which also end up increasing yields, so great for farmers. Concentrated solar power, instead of using photovoltaics, this is using mirrors to concentrate the sun's rays onto uh, salt or, uh, or water to create steam and turn turbines and produce electricity. So, right, so coal, natural gas, nuclear, these are all just ways of boiling water. So here's one. Afforestation, creating new forests where they haven't been before for at least 50 years or so. Um, this is a, a mahogany plantation in, in Hawaii. Some coming attractions, building with wood. There are now these incredible high performance timber products, uh, cross laminated timber and blue lums that these are not the two by fours that you see in, in Home Depot. They are as strong as concrete and steel and they actually turn out to do better in a fire. So they char on the outside, but they retain their structural integrity. Um, and you can imagine how beautiful a building made of wood is, right? Um, there's going to be an 80-story wood building in London. There's already um, a, a many multi-story wood building going up in Portland. Um, what you have here is kind of, again, a double whammy. So creating uh, concrete and steel, both of those together, about 10% of our annual emissions. So you can displace some of those emissions, and if you're using something like afforestation, you have sequestered carbon, and then a building actually becomes a storehouse for carbon, right? Um, so it's dry wood is about 50% carbon, so about 50% of the building structure then is holding carbon uh, in place, which is I think, incredibly cool. Uh, this will be the last one. Uh, this is the only solution with a ridiculous name. You can tell that we like added this at the very end of the book process, and we were feeling a bit punchy, I think. So a cow walks onto a beach. Um, it turns out that there is a species of red algae called Asparagopsis taxiformis, that if cows and sheep eat 2% of that in their feed, they end up dropping their methane production by 70 to 90%. <laughs> Just some algae, right? So how do you make enough algae, right, to feed a lot of sheep and a lot of cows to actually make it make a difference? Well, one idea is that those folks are talking with these folks um, who have figured out these incredible sort of lattice-like structures in the ocean uh, to grow kelp forests, where basically because of um, ocean acidification and warming, there's now just no life. So these systems kind of pull the uh, very nutrient-rich cold waters of the deep ocean up. They grow super, super fast and kelp sequesters carbon faster than any plants on land. And then maybe you end up with a product for food or cow supplement or fuel or fiber, tons of cool opportunities. There's a father-son uh, duo in Siberia who have created something called the Pleistocene Park. They are proving out a hypothesis that if you repopulate the subarctic with herbivores, who lived there until humans killed them all off? Mammoths, oxen, fat, furry horses, and, and others. Um, the way they move around in the subarctic, they're grazing, their hooves are shuffling, right? They're pushing snow back. And as they do that, the temperature of the soil drops, and it may drop just enough to keep the permafrost frozen and to keep the methane and the permafrost in place and not have it released. Um, they have literally, I think, begged, borrowed, and maybe stolen uh, animals to populate this place to see in park and have this thing come to life, and it's just, it's, it's super, super cool. So we started with this kind of dominant story arc of doom and gloom, right? That sort of tells us that human beings are terrible, horrible, no good, very bad, greedy, lazy, incompetent, and transigent. Right, and, and all the rest. So much so that you sort of start to wonder, like, why are we trying to save these humans if they're this bad, right? But when you come in through the lens of solutions, I think there's another part of the story that becomes really clear, which is that we are collaborative and compassionate and creative and committed, and sometimes we show up in ways that are brilliant and even gutsy. 
And I think if we want to stay in this work and stay courageous, and we want to invite others to join us and not do <laughs> the monkey moves, right? I think we have to remember this side of the story. We have to remember that this is also who we are and who we can be. This is already what we're doing and it's what we can do at, at even greater scale. The climate movement has gotten really, really good at giving an I have a nightmare speech. Can you imagine if Martin Luther King Jr. gets up at the March on Washington and says, I have a nightmare and let me tell you, we have to remember that we need more than the aim of averting catastrophe. We need to have a vision worth fighting for. And the vision that's worth fighting for is embedded in the solutions. It is that better, more resilient, more regenerative world that we can bring about. So what we hope that we have done with this book is start to at least contribute to clarifying that vision, to help us remember that we already have the technical capacity we need. We already have the toolbox we need. We, we will be getting more solutions, but we don't need to wait. We just need to step on the gas. It is really up to us whether or not we'll have the human capacity to deploy the toolbox that we have in hand. I love um, Mary Oliver's most recent collection of poems. There's a line, uh, she says, only if you have angels in your head will you ever possibly see one. And I think we have to be keepers of that. We have to be keepers of the possibility, even as we work through what Parker Palmer calls the tragic gap of where we are currently, right? And hold that space between what is and what could be and what should be. Um, so we're certainly, you know, sometimes people say, oh, Drawdown is so optimistic. And we didn't set out to do a hope project. We set out to do a reality project. Like maybe the answer would have been it is game over or it's game over until we get that silver bullet. But what we found by doing the math is not that the bar isn't high, and not that the odds, odds are not long, but that it is not game over. It actually should be game on. I'll stop there and we'll do some questions. talk a lot about carbon dioxide and sometimes talk about it as if it's the only one. It's the most um, voluminous one, uh, but we also have methane, nitrous oxide, um, HFCs, those are the refrigerant gases, the, the fluorinated gases, um, water vapor also traps heat. Um, so, so there's a, a kind of family of them um, and, and sometimes I think we use carbon as a catch-all, um, which is not actually scientifically correct. Thank you so much for your talk. Mm. Your team gathers all this data and then does calculations to look at empirical comparisons between different impacts and what we think of. But I can imagine that other groups can look at that same data and have very different um, set of priorities based on how they factor, what kind of algorithms to use, what kind of factors to consider. I'm wondering if your team allows that data and the calculations and algorithms that you did use to be made publicly available so that other teams can also compare. Yeah, it's a critical part of our project. Um, we're working through some of the legalities right now with uh, the sort of licenses for the data. But our whole aspiration has been to have all of the models um, open source, online, available. You can pop the hood, you can play with the assumptions um, and, and kind of you know, do, do different scenarios. Um, so the assumptions are very much informed by kind of ranges within the academic literature and then us trying to land on a relatively conservative side, right? We wanted the criticism to be, hey guys, you know, wind, onshore wind can do a lot more than what, than what you said. We didn't want the criticism to be, hey guys, that's like really, you know, out in, out in left field. Um, we think of this as a, as a living project. So this is kind of a snapshot of the research so far. Um, the modeling continues. There are academic institutions and other individuals who've come in and said, hey, I want to help with this, I want to help with that. There's kind of a, a, co we're a 
coalition is emerging around all sorts of things, but one of those is continuing kind of the journey of, of the research. And part of that's making it open source. Part of it we hope will be um, beginning to nationalize and regionalize and even localize um, the models so that they are even more useful for, um, for planning, right, uh, at the city level, for example. Um, we also start, want to start incorporating some of the hows, right? So what happens to these models if you put a price on carbon, if you put a climate tax in place? Um, what then becomes possible, right? So thinking about, you've got the solutions that kind of do the work of reducing emissions, but then you've got a whole bunch of different ways that you can accelerate them and kind of grease the skin. So, so those are all um, future things, and it's certainly, Projections are always wrong, right? They just are. Um, but we think that we have been um, we're kind of responsible to the literature around these solutions um, and, and landed in a good place. But we also hope that we'll be getting great feedback um, and even more feedback when the models are, are available. So we're hoping at least, yeah, we're hoping that in, by the end of the year, we're hoping we'll at least have sort of an interactive dashboard that maybe addresses the issues of the not being able to release the data, um, but where you can at least tinker and, and play with assumptions, right, and, and key inputs. Um, this is a really a, a lawyery question, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and, and, and we got data, you know, sort of thousands of data sources. So it's a, it's a bit of a, a, a gnarly question um, that we're working through right now. Yeah. Yes? This is extremely informative and really hopeful. It's so much to think about. And then I was, I started to think about the particular political landscape that we are in right now in the United States. And I just felt just like the point. Yeah. And so, and then you were just talking about what could be done at the local It's a great, it's a great question, and it was interesting to have this. The book came out about, I don't know, five or six weeks before the White House announcement about the intention to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. Um, it depends on, it, it sort of depends on, on, on where we're talking to folks. So, for example, the Commonwealth of Nations, which is 52 or 53 countries, right? Basically, the former British colonies, except us. Um, they want to use drawdown for climate action planning across all of those countries. So that's kind of a you know a, a way to reach an, um, an umbrella um, and kind of cascade out um, this work really quickly. In in the U.S., we're getting I would say the most interest from cities. So there are cities who are saying, forget climate action planning, we're not doing that anymore. We're doing drawdown. Or Nova Scotia has just said we're going to get to drawdown by 2025. That's what we're going to do. Um, so we're really excited to see the goal kind of becoming, um, starting to become a meme, right? And something that people are like, oh yeah, that's like, that's a really clear thing to aim for as opposed to just like climate action. It feels, can feel I think really fuzzy, like what are we actually aiming for? Um, you know, the, the, the reality is that in the US, um, most of the progress on emissions reductions has happened in spite of the federal government for many, many years. Um, you know, even under the Obama administration, a lot of those, um, uh, a lot of those uh, kind of um, pieces and policies didn't never even came into effect because they've been tied up in court. Um, so really the leaders have been, cities and some states and companies and universities um, and others, they've been the leaders and I think they're going to continue being the leaders. Um, and I think the, the kind of, I hate to say silver lining, but silver lining of the, um, of, of the announcement about the Paris Agreement was, well, all of a sudden there were a whole lot of people who didn't know about the Paris Agreement, but then knew about it. There were a whole bunch of folks that were already leading that doubled down and said, we're gonna do more. We're staying in this. We're gonna, we're gonna, meet, we're gonna meet our targets. Um, and I think the climate movement actually grew overnight. Um, this is totally anecdotal, but just from my own kind of social media and people who reached out to me there were lots of folks who have never been active on climate, but all of a sudden were like, whoa, you know, I have kids and I'm worried about this. What should I do? Who should I work with? Where should I give money? 
Um, and, and I think that is exciting, right? When we start to begin owning this as a collective effort, as opposed to something that Washington can solve, um, I think we're in better shape. And we really need Washington to be working on some of those accelerants, right? To be greasing the skids for some of these solutions. Um, but they are moving. And I think there's really, really good news on the energy side of things, which is that um, solar and wind, the cost has dropped so much quicker than anyone was predicting, and the technologies have improved so much quicker than anyone was predicting. So JP Morgan released a study this summer that within three years, solar and wind will be the cheapest source of electricity generation globally. Well, now all of a sudden we're in a situation where economics are a wind at the back of renewable energy. Um, and the, you know, it's not sort of pushing into the wind um, to, to get solar wind and, and others going. So I think there are pieces of good, of good news. Um, and I also don't want to sugarcoat um, that, that what's happening uh, in Washington and to the EPA is not super concerning because we, we need everyone pulling together in the same direction. Yeah, it's 
So there are lots of debates about this. Um, so some scientists would say 400. Some would say 350. Um, you know, you could think all the way back to sort of the beginning of the, of the Industrial Revolution. That would be more like 300. Um, so again, there are kind of d debates about this, like, what's a safe zone, right, for, for stabilization. Um, it's, you know, I, I think it's an interesting area. We're, we're so far away from that, that really how we just get to drawdown, that tipping point of drawdown and begin coming down the other side. Um, we got a ton of work to do and many decades on that before we could even get to a place of like, how low would you ever want to go? Does that make sense? Great. Thank you. Um, what do you do uh, with, in, considering where we are and, and part of the country that we are, and part of the world we are, what, how do you handle the apocalyptic, the person that wants to take you into that box hole, as you are having that discussion? How do you, what, what, how do you treat that? Yeah. What's the best way to handle that? Yeah. Um. This is a big question. <laughs> um, so I would say, and, and this was very much for me a kind of a, a, a takeaway from my PhD research um, and, and that book Between God and Green, which is that we lock ourselves into, debate, into debating science and policy, right? And there's a lot of debates about, you know, all, all sorts of theories about, you know, geologic history and ice cores and other right, right. Oftentimes, I think the important thing to do is to step back and say, maybe this isn't about science. And maybe this isn't about policy. Maybe this is something that is deeper, that feels like it's at stake, or a value that's getting stepped on, or something that feels uncomfortable or scary. Um, and I think when we can open up those spaces, we do better. I think when we stay in this like factoid, 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 factoid kind of place, um, it's, it's, it's hard to make progress. Um, getting sort of the right message with the right messenger to the right audience is really important. Um, so there's great work uh, that's done out of Yale called uh, Global Warming Six Americas. So they basically did kind of an audience segmentation analysis of kind of what people think about climate change, what they think we should do about it, if we should do anything about it. Um, and I think it's really helpful for kind of at least having some sort of structure to think about who is it that I'm talking to, kind of where do they sit on this spectrum, and then what are some of the messages that work, right, that don't end up throwing up um, maybe at least quite as tall of, of a brick wall. Um, Dominica is facing this, you know, day in and day out as she tries to do climate education around the state. Um, I think it, I, I honestly think it takes sort of trial and error um, and trying to keep an eye on, on the things, on the things that work. I'm also really, um, I'm hopeful that the solutions begin to give, to, to bring other ways in, right? Um, so we've been going, going, going at like long-term existential threat, you know, and that's like, that's just not what people care about or think about, right? We are fundamentally not hardwired that way. Um, but when you start thinking about solutions that create jobs and improve health and um, help communities to be more resilient in the face of climate impacts or help farmers grow more food, right? Like these sorts of things become, I think, a way in where it's like emissions aside, these are great things, these are great solutions for a lot of the problems in the world. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that there's maybe more common ground there. Um, and, and around the economics as well, um, it starts to become, become really, really clear that, that some of these things are smart. So in some ways, I think it's like, can you just maybe not talk about climate change and actually move forward on some of the things um, that solve it, but that might pull people in because they have other priorities? Can I follow up with that a little bit? Yeah. And ask about potential of reframing questions. Um, one of the things you said that I just loved was projections are always wrong. They just are. And as a scientist, I understand exactly what you mean. Yeah. But 
from someone who is not familiar with the science that can be read as in why you pay attention right. to the projections yeah. if they're always wrong. Yeah. And that's exactly the wrong way to frame the question. Yeah, that's right. So how do we get the question reframed yeah. so that the acknowledgement that the scientific projections may not be exact or yeah. completely confident yeah. is beside the point. Yes. Um, I think I think it's I think it's such a great point. Yeah, because you hear things like, well, if scientists can't tell us exactly what's going to be happening in you know northeastern Iowa in 2030, then like forget it, right? But it's the it's it's precisely the uncertainty that is what we should be worried about, right? So certainly for the last 12,000 years, we've had a pretty darn predictable climate. Not that there haven't been extremes, but what has allowed civilization to emerge the way that it is has been that relative predictability and stability. And all of a sudden, we are playing with that at a much more rapid pace than we've ever experienced. Um, and, and so now we've got kind of ranges of, of things that might happen. Um, and it's the uncertainty about what we'll be looking at that should make us want to turn around and, and go back the other way. Um, we talked about some other, some other kind of things in, in the car yesterday. I think there's something around this desire for predictability around the climate and clarity, 100% clarity. It's like, well, if you have one doctor that tells you you have cancer and one doctor that tells you you don't, what are you gonna do? You're probably gonna treat the cancer, right? Um, if you've got 100 engineers and 99 of them tell you this bridge is not safe to go over, and one who says it is, insists that it is, are you going to go over the bridge? Right? I, I think starting to make some of these analogies is, is maybe helpful, but I, I'd love also to hear your thoughts um, on, on how to address that question. Great. I think we should probably wrap it up now, but thank you so much, Catherine. Really fantastic.